Should we say Kenichiwa or no? Is that too cheesy? Probably too. Uh, someone would be like, that's cultural appropriation. <laughs> well, not yeah. <laughs> Hello, friends, and welcome to Animation. I'm Merv, and this is my buddy Blake. Hello. With its ever rising popularity, our goal is to make anime accessible to people new to the genre, like me. On this episode, we're talking about Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust. Uh, Blake, you want to tell them why we're looking at this one? Yeah, so this is the first anime that I ever watched, and it was dubbed, as I like to watch all my anime one of these days. We'll get to that conversation. But this movie came out in 2000. It's actually kind of a sequel. So there was a Vampire Hunter D movie that came out in 1985. And then 15 years later in the year 2000, Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust came out. And I honestly don't, I think I saw it in a video store or something. I just remember I had a actual VHS cassette of this movie and I just, I loved it. I had never watched any anime. I had not even considered watching anime. I didn't even know it was anime when I picked up this movie. But after watching it, it I just fell in love. And now, so many years later, I've watched significantly more entertainment from Japan. And I love it. So, uh, yeah, that's... I guess that's my story about the first anime I watched, and that's why we're covering it today. Figured it would be a good one to talk about. Do we want to do our rating? Let's do a rating, yeah. Okay. You want to kick that off, or do you want me to? Uh, you can do it, because I don't know the yep. words. All right, got it. All right, so we're going <laughs> to go ahead and rate as we do each time. We rate first and then discuss. So here we go. First comes rock jang can pan two five okay five so we're we're gonna be a little bit different on this which is awesome we'll explain. yep yep we'll talk through it and one i'm i guess i should know i won't be afraid to give fives because i always think it's weird when people are like the perfect score is reserved for the perfect movie i think that's a little pretentious but yeah, let's let's talk about what Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust is about. So Merv, in your own words, what is this story about? Okay, so D is the name of a character who is a half vampire, uh Dan Peel, they call him, and he is a vampire hunter, thus Vampire Hunter D. He is tasked with finding Charlotte who has been kidnapped by a vampire. Later, we find out that she has actually run away with this vampire. And he must go through a series of events to rescue her. Uh, and along the way, he meets up with another group of hunters called the Marcus Brothers. And uh, they have a series of Pass that they must do until the end when D must make a decision to let the two leave and fly to a different planet or kill them. <laughs> nice. Or one of those two options. All right. So to me, Vampire Hunter D at its root is Dracula mixed with blade so you've got a basic dracula story of a vampire in love with a human and them being misunderstood mixed with a half human half vampire hunter that hunts vampires so you've basically got dracula and blade the vampire's name is meyer not dracula and the human's name is charlotte not what's the Mina. Yeah, Mina, not Mina. Then, like you said, there's a band of bounty hunters and D who have both been hired by Charlotte's father to find her and bring her home one way or another. They fight their way through some evil creatures and demons called the Barbaroi. And the Barbaroi, they work for Carmilla, who's another vampire. 
and they end up uh, D and the bounty hunters, the Marcus brothers, they end up fighting Meyer and Carmilla at the end. I also won't spoil the end like you didn't, but I will mention that there is also a spaceship. <laughs> there is a there is a spaceship. Yeah, that flies out of a castle, which is pretty sweet. It looks cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's weird. It is weird for sure. But they're going to outer space as vampires, space vampires. That's a thing, right? So as a writer, once again, Merv, how well did? the vampire hunter d bloodlust script writers do writing this from a writer's perspective and a, a story perspective well now i rated this movie a two on our scale based on what i recommend it to people now i actually enjoyed the movie but it would be very difficult to recommend Though not because of the writing. The, the writing did two things very well, and one thing that I didn't like as much. Um, like we talked about before, the overall plot was pretty easy to understand. Hire a guy, he's a bounty hunter. We've seen plenty of bounty hunter movies and read plenty of bounty hunter books. He has to go find Charlotte uh, and defeat a vampire. Pretty simple plot, so that wasn't too hard to follow. The other thing I liked that it did really well was... What's the female's Marcus brother's name? Marcus brother's? Oh, Layla. Layla. Yeah. Layla. Mm-hmm. The other thing it did really well was give the characters a decision to make at the end. And that's always very interesting for viewers. The best decisions, too, are good and good or bad and bad. If a character is deciding, should I stay with my abusive husband or run away with this sensitive man who loves me? That's a very boring decision because it's a, should I do this bad thing or do this good thing? But if you make a character decide a good or a good outcome, should I stay in my small town and marry my high school sweetheart or should I go become a Hollywood actor that's, you know, either of those are good things, but they both are giving up something else. Um, or if it's two bad decisions, like Spider-Man's girlfriend is falling, but also a bus is falling, and e either one of these things, a bad, a bad thing is going to happen. And at the end of this, the characters have that kind of decision, let the vampire live and let their love go on, or kill them. It's a decision that um, is very thoughtful and I think it it really helps the viewer connect and it's an interesting ending. The thing I think where the story kind of suffers is it's very episodic. We have to go here. Uh, I have a list here even. We have to go fight the Barbaroi monsters and then we have to fight the sheriff in the small town. And then we have to fight the tree lady, who's one of the monsters. And then on the bridge, we have to fight the werewolf. And then we have to fight Carmela. And in most uh, Western stories or movies, we have a rising action where things keep getting worse and worse for the character. But this is like a reset. I, we have defeated this monster. Now we have to go defeat this monster. Now we have to go defeat this monster which I think is probably something that comes from it being adapted from a serialized manga. Um, but that didn't, it didn't really um, hurt me too bad to watch. So those are the things I thought it did well. The plot, a simple plot that we can follow, and the really good decision. That was the best part to me is there's a very good decision at the end for the characters to make. Tells us a lot about the characters and then the kind of part that I thought could have been a little stronger is if it wasn't so episodic, if every time they defeated a monster, also something, he loses an arm. Now he has to fight a monster without an arm, he, so, so on and so forth. Right. And that's a, it's interesting you brought that up because that's a very common thing in anime are different arcs. And usually 
it's the heroes powering up or showcasing stronger power versus getting weakened in some way. So usually it's um, their arcs because they're based off books, like you said, and they have to fight tougher and tougher adversaries. So they have to get stronger and stronger versus having new adversities come up is, is just a typical kind of way that the anime works. So I think that's interesting. I, I don't know if it was as bad as like um, Rise of Skywalker, where you have to go get this MacGuffin and then go get that MacGuffin. And, you know, I think that was a little worse when it when it came to that. But I could definitely see your point in it feeling kind of tasky in that way. Yeah, that might be one of the reasons why Western audiences didn't connect with Rise of Skywalker was because go do this. Well, we did that. Okay, now go do this. Hey, we did it. Now, it's, it was it was also quite episodic. Right, right. And a host of other problems that we won't get into on this show. <laughs> you don't have the time. <laughs> no. All right. So now I think we can get into the diss track where we talk about the things that we did not like about this movie now that we've covered the story. And since you've spoke to some of those already, Merv, are there any other items you wanted to add to the diss track? Yeah, the biggest thing for me that was, made me struggle was there were a lot of payoffs without setups. So it's cool that all the characters have different powers. That is something that I like, like the different monsters, the werewolf with the belly that becomes a maw and the, the uh, tree woman who can uh, kind of combine with either metal or, or wood and become spiky. And those are cool, except when I don't know their powers, then I lose some of the stakes because at any moment their powers can change. And I don't know if the stakes are lowered or raised. Um, a couple examples was when the woman... I keep calling her the tree lady, even though she can fuse with metal as well, I believe. Uh, she fuses with a tree and then gets stabbed in the head. And then we think she's dead. But then she's not dead because her powers also apparently let her live through a head stabbing, which we didn't know. And then even worse than that, a coincidence saves Layla. Layla is about to be killed by the tree woman and the tree gets struck by lightning and the tree that kills the tree lady. Coincidences are fine if they add danger to your characters, but it's they're not great to save characters. That's a tough that's a tough pill to swallow uh, that a random lightning strike save save the day. And so it was just little things like that, uh, that those coincidences and the unknown powers springing up um, was one thing that kind of turned me off. It's interesting you brought up the unknown power thing. I actually, and this is probably why we are different on this one. I appreciate the surprise of it. I don't, I didn't necessarily need to be explained what everyone's powers were in order to, and I don't know, just kind of stick with it. However, I have that exact point about the plant woman. I don't even think we get a name for her. And she's got Layla on the ropes. And Layla gets saved by a lightning strike that kills her. I thought that was pretty lame. I, it would have been super easy to write that and showcase that a different way than literally a stroke of lightning saving you. Even if the lightning had struck the knife that she stabbed into her head would have been some setup to a lightning strike. Right, right. And that would have taken that would have taken zero effort to execute. However, I there is one part D actually cuts her head off and some of her like 
spikes and stuff earlier in the film. So there's a little bit of setup once she gets to Layla that she has that kind of invincibility. However, then there wasn't necessarily set up for that piece of it, right? But you do see D go like, and then her head gets separated, and then all of a sudden she's back again. That um, that setup, that's oh, sorry, that's a good setup. I that I didn't catch. Yeah, yeah, it was quick, and that's actually something else I have on my diss track is some of the action in Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust is great. A lot of it, though, falls into the, and it's again, a, kind of an anime thing where you don't see the action, you see the result of the action. So I don't see D swing a sword. I just see plant lady's head come off super briefly, you know, and, and there's quite a few examples of that throughout the film where you, the action is just not included. And you just see the result of the action, which is kind of a bummer in an action movie to me. Not a big deal, but definitely something on my diss track. I thought I thought I had fallen asleep during the werewolf fight. Yeah, because suddenly the werewolf just I I'm, the second time I watched it, I, I watched it twice just because I'm like, what did I miss something? But no, that werewolf fight. And he's like the second he's like the second to last boss. Yeah, fight. And he just dies like a bitch from something, right? He's just standing well, there and he's like, do you got me? Ugh. Yeah. I, they showed D briefly in his eye, like coming yeah. at him with that sword. Yeah. So that, that part was a, a negative for me. And these few negatives I have are counterbalanced by the nostalgia. And that's how I arrive at a five, right? You've got to add a little bit from, for nostalgia's sake. And then uh, there's these few other things, too. The last one, uh, couple I have is one for it being Vampire Hunter D bloodlust. I feel like there's not a ton of D in the movie. I feel like it's a lot of the more of the side characters. And I'm such a fan of the voice actor Andrew Philpot, who does D's voice. And he actually does a couple other animes, Ninja Scroll and Twilight of the Dark Master. So if anyone watches Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust and you're looking for some similar movies with the same voice actor, Ninja Scroll and Twilight of the Dark Master, I can recommend both of those. But I, I would have liked more D in the movie. And then the last thing, this is my favorite thing for the diss track <laughs> your favorite diss yeah this is my favorite part for the diss track and it's borgov's joke so there are parts in this movie <laughs> that are f funny where the jokes land and i'll talk about that once we get to the things that we liked our favorite things borgov's joke is terrible and i've actually got it here word for word so i'm going to read through it just so that everyone listening or watching can agree with me so this is i'm, I'm a, i might be able to do the voice maybe not you ever heard the one about the owl and the squirrel squirrel works all summer storing away stuff for the winter all kinds of nuts and seeds he works real hard then one day just before the first snow he goes outside for one last look around when all of a sudden this owl swoops down and grabs him, carries him off. Ah, what a shame, says the squirrel, because what's going to happen to all that good food? Yeah, <laughs> was it a joke? I thought it was like a fable. No, he's he's he starts with, did you ever hear the one about the squirrel and the owl? And then at the end. His, the other guys in the, in the group of, <laughs> they do start laughing. Yeah, they start laughing. It has a setup just like a joke and it has a payoff just like a joke, which is the other guys laughing, but it is not funny at all. No, it's not a joke. I just took it as like a moral, like a, like, here's a, here's a little moral story. This squirrel who was like a hard worker like that 
always going after the nuts and food, but got killed by the owl, so he wasted his life. Right. Like, they were wasting their life going after, like, money and stuff and not, like, having fun. Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to go one more diss, and this is my this is kind of my big diss and why I give it a two, even though, like I said, I, I, genu- I genuinely liked the movie, but it's hard to recommend because the ending, I got so lost. And it was with the Carmella fight, and suddenly she was giving them fantasies I understood it better the second time I watched it. But the first time I watched it, again, a little bit because I didn't know her power. You know, like, all D has to do is, Layla, when we go in here, don't believe anything you see. Because D wasn't fooled for a second. He just sliced his mom in half. And everyone else was fooled. And so the first time I watched it, I I was very confused and the um the weirdness of it in the in this in the space vampires the rocket ship to a utopian planet filled with vampires I suppose uh was just it was just a little weird for me for new people new to anime like like myself to kind of follow with all these powers kind of coming And it also gave me a world building question like, okay, we've killed all the vampires, but those Barbaroi monsters, they seemed way more dangerous than the vampires. We don't, we're just going to let them go ahead and live, but we hate vampires. So that, that was, that's where really where I get the, um, my, my two, like why I don't really recommend it, especially to, to people who are new to anime probably people who have watched a lot of anime and are used to surprise powers uh, and that kind of and those kind of story beat movements will really enjoy it um but for me i was i had to do too much work keeping track of things to really uh, enjoy that end and so i think when i watched it the second time i was able to enjoy it a little bit more Right. And that makes sense because this is a movie I've probably watched 10 times in my life. I've watched it quite a bit. So it does, in my mind today, feel a lot more cohesive. I know what's going to happen. So, well, I really liked, and uh, I mean, I guess at this point, should we move into the stuff that we like? Yeah, go for it. I really liked the motivation when D's hand. I think is the one who's like your real motivation here is to not m- or to make sure there is no other damn peels like it, that you don't happen again because your life has been so miserable. You don't want to wish this upon anyone else. And I like that. And then it made the money stuff kind of make sense. Like, that's eh, not that much money, even though it sounds like a lot at first. But what he's really doing is trying to rectify his life via stopping it from happening, recycling again. Right. And here you've got a human and a vampire who can make another Dunpeel, another half vampire. So yeah, I thought that was poignant too. What else did you like? I liked the design of the world. It was futuristic, but also in many ways, Victorian. And things were designed with crucifixes on them, even like the cars or people's tattoos and stuff like that. Um, I like that a lot. I like the Marcus brothers quite a bit. I liked how they set them up with a huge fight and they killed all those zombies. It's like, oh, this is a, a secondary. It's an antagonist, but it's not an enemy. It's not a bad guy. They are trying to stop D from his goal. And they are good guys, but they are also antagonists. Um, and so I really liked them. And I just kind of liked, I liked their power. And again, uh, one thing I've noticed in the few that we've watched, anime does very cool opening sequences. Just gets you like involved right away. It's very atmospheric, very dark. Uh, the original series of 
of Meyer coming in to uh, interact with Charlotte early on was something I really liked. Right, with all the crosses and everything melting. And yeah, yeah, it was a very cool opening sequence. I also think the first time we meet D is very reminiscent of um, Indiana Jones, where there's just this paused moment just to appreciate the hero, which was very cool. I also had the world. I think the world is amazing. It's steampunk mixed with Victorian England, mixed with an 80s, 90s fashion sense. So, (laughs) you know, black (laughs) cloaks and coats with colorful outfits with huge shoulder pads. Lots of leather. (laughs) Yeah, so... I mean, you can't go wrong with steampunk Victorian England 80s, 90s fashion. I think that's cool. Yeah, the designs were all really cool. Yeah, and there's just weird stuff like flying sand mantas. The werewolf, you mentioned this earlier, the werewolf's jaws are its stomach. Just a lot of creativity. And that's common in anime. And one of the reasons to be excited to watch anime is you will find so many different things that We just don't see here because everything's got to be done by committee and everything's got to be done to be safe and appeal to the largest audience possible. So we don't get as much weirdness. You know, every once in a while, a movie will come out like John dies at the end where it's just off the wall, but we don't get that very often. There was a, a safe house that Meyer was in. And the security system for this safe house is eyeballs that shoot laser beams at you. You That reminded me of Legend of Zelda. Yeah. Yeah. It's also Japanese property. Yeah. Very. It was very cool. And Dee's just flicking rocks at it. Well, not to mention Dee's uh, sidekick is his talking hand parasite. That can suck, suck spells in. Yeah. The hand, the hand is very cool. And, I looked for it. I don't think we get a name for the hand. No, I don't. Not that I that not that I'm aware of, or even a why it exists or how it exists. There's definitely not a why or a how, and I love that. But that's one of the things I love about anime. I don't want to know. I just think it's cool that there's a face in his hand. Yeah, I don't for that for that aspect. I don't need to know any more than. He's a parasite. And he wants D to live because if D dies, he dies. And all of this combines to somehow fit in the same world, which I think is very impressive and a testament to the animators and the original art creators who can take all of these separate themes and things and somehow mix them into a world. We haven't even really talked much about too much about the Barbaroi, which is if you're afraid of creepy clowns, you know, that's pure nightmare fuel sometimes. And somehow even they fit these demon circus somethings somehow fit in the world too. The character, the Barbaroi, had a striking resemblance to the dungeon master from the old Dungeons and Dragons cartoon from the 80s and i don't know who inspired who but there's no way one of those characters didn't inspire the other one they were both short old men with bald around the top with long hair which is you know fairly common for like wizards or old wise people or whatever but then they both wore the uh, a red robe with gold trim that went down and like covered their entire bodies. And so I like that character just for that reason. And really, I said it before, but the thing, my favorite part of this movie is that decision at the end. Very strong decision. Very compelling for the audience. It was very, very good and very rare in a lot of storytelling. Not not just Western, not Eastern, not middle of the road, not North. Western, <laughs> just, uh, just you don't see it a lot. Yeah, very cool. Some of the humor did land for me, especially the sheriff part. 
he was he was very funny when he was talking about the dun peel and how we don't like dun peels around here and that's just the way it is and it was very stereotypical american south accent and american south attitude which you know sometimes it lands sometimes it doesn't but what i really liked there is it went from him sounding funny and dumb to a touching story that the vendor whose store they were all in because D was trying to buy a horse. A $300,000 horse. Yeah, $300,000 horse. And the story that the owner told about how D had saved him when he was a kid. And I thought that was, it was just impressive how it can go from something funny to something heartwarming. We're usually in serious. We're usually movies like Marvel. You have to do the opposite, where if there's anything that's heartwarming or too serious, you have to break it up with a joke. And here it went the opposite way, which I thought was cool, too. This comes out of a book called Story by McKee. Is charges in every scene. So if you start a scene. Sad, it should end or at some point should be some have some positive charge it could be funny it could be heartwarming uh it can go sad again at the end like you could have a loop but there has to be different charges a positive negative positive charge in marvel movies often they're doing this but the only thing they have to fall back on is like a quip Mm. well we've got this sad scene and we know we have to change the charge of the scene so we need a quip to make it funny and sometimes that works really well and sometimes it doesn't work Right. It's what Joss, it's basically what Joss Whedon uses. And that's uh, kind of has shaped what we think of as uh, the Marvel, Marvel way. So whenever, if you're ever watching a movie and, and, and there's a scene that falls flat for you, or someone says like, oh, emotionally, this felt flat. It's usually because there's no charge change. It's a sad, sad scene that starts sad. The characters are sad. A sad thing ha- happens and it ends sad. And that's kind of can get flat, feels flat or feels boring. Or you might be watching something and going, this is exciting, but I'm not excited. And that's because it starts exciting, becomes exciting and stays exciting. And so you need those positive and negative charges. And that do- that scene does that very well. Well, wow, yeah, that's that's super interesting. Awesome. So those were all of the positives that. Let me say that again. I'm trying to think of a better way. I really in, I really enjoyed you covering that. I thought that was really intuitive, so I didn't want it, that to fall flat. So I'm trying to change my charge here. Um, so those, But those were the positives I had. Those were the few nitpicks I had. Overall, the movie is... I, I would agree with you. I, I don't know if the ending is super beginner-friendly. However... If you've ever watched a movie like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and enjoyed it, you're you're not going to understand half of what happens in that movie and it can still be enjoyable. I I think there are some things that uh, an opportunity where maybe the ending's a little convoluted. However, I would still recommend this movie. I think it's um, a tight enough story and and kind of a self-contained enough story with enough interesting moments for me to recommend it to people who are interested in anime. Maybe, Merv, to your point, we set this up for like the fifth anime someone watches, right? I don't know. What do you think as far as a recommendation? Yeah. Like I said, I enjoyed the movie and there are things that I will uh, nitpick in anything I watch. But for recommending it to neophytes that'd be it'd be a tough sell for me to recommend it to new people because the first time i watched it and i'm gonna assume most people aren't doing an anime podcast so they're not watching something multiple times over the course of a couple days and the first time i watched it the ending i had to do so much work trying to figure out what was happening and what was going on that if you want to watch it twice, yeah, then I'd probably recommend it. But that's why that's why my recommendation was so so low. Not that it was bad, 
because I, like I said, I actually enjoyed it, especially the second time, but it'd just be hard for me to recommend. Yeah, completely fair. So we've got our opposing charges. So hopefully that means that this was impactful. Is there anything else you would like to say about Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust from the year 2000? There is not. All right. Well, <laughs> thanks team for watching or listening. However you get our animation podcast, whether it's on YouTube, Podbean, Google, or Apple. Look forward to more episodes very soon. We'll be deciding on what's next and, and getting together in about a week. So thanks, team, and have a great one. Have a good one. I gather from your letter that you've had a rather difficult time. I think I can understand what it's like. Love is not unique to humans, you know. 